to give the Lord some praise this morning. Happy singer, I will praise. I will praise. I will praise your name. 
and your desire constantly is to do us good. We bless you this morning. We give you praise, Lord. We confess there is no other God besides you. Because it's in you we live, in you we move, in you we have our being. Thank you for the privilege of coming before you this morning. And thank you once again for the privilege of visiting with us today. Accept our thanks and our worship in the name of Jesus. Lord, for the rest of this service, visit us. We come here every now and then that we may be recharged in our spirits. We come here that we may be rebuked. We come here that we may be encouraged. We come here that we may be equipped that we will go out and live the kind of life you want us to live. This morning, equip us, challenge us, encourage us. And if you want to rebuke us, Lord, that we will become more and more the people that you want us to be. That when the world looks at us, they will see Jesus in us. Strip us, O oh God, of every form of hypocrisy. Strip us, O oh God, of every form of double-sided nature of life that we live. Help us that we'll be transparent. That what people see will be the real Jesus in us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Please be seated in the name of Jesus. I'm sure you're wondering what is pastor doing with a mask this morning. Well, I guess I thought I should be a bit dramatic this morning to illustrate what I wanted to talk about. And if you have not been attending this church, obviously you won't know who is behind this mask. Am I correct? Yes. And even if you've been attending this church, you are not sure whether it's pastor or somebody else who is impersonating pastor. Okay, you recognize the voice, hallelujah. But I'm sure that you know there are people who have the same voice types as others. This morning, I'd like to speak on a topic that says, don't live a two-faced life. Don't live a two-faced life. Or to make it simple, don't live a double life. I'd like to read a couple of scriptures, and I would appreciate if the people on the multimedia can help me with them very quickly. First John chapter 1. We read verses 5 and 6, and then we look at Ephesians chapter 5, 11 and 13. First John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Thank you so much. So verse John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 and 13. Ephesians 5, 11 and 13. Ephesians 5, 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Verse 13. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever thoughts make manifest is light. This week I received a couple of sad news. The first sad news, I'll be talking about it before the end of the service, I'll possibly just say a few things around that. But the second piece of sad news is one that is global in nature. There is a well-respected gentleman known globally acknowledged as a grounded theologian and one who is known as a Christian apologist. The field of Christian apologetics, now some of you say I speak a lot of grammar, but this is what you should know. Apologetics is a field of theology 
that is concerned with defending the Christian faith against objections. You should know that. Because there are many times people ask you some strange questions. Questions like, where did the original man come from? Or where, where was God before God became? You know, some questions you don't have answers to. And a lot of scientists keep railing certain things against Christians. It's, it's the apologists or the field of apologetics that brings rational answers to questions. A lot of times when we are asked some things, we say we don't know the secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to us. But the field of apologetics looks at science and provides a scriptural explanation for science. And so there are centers all over the world. There's a gentleman, you should read his works. His name is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote very profusely. Uh, C.S. Lewis was, a, was, an, uh, was um, what do you call this people that don't believe in God? Yes, thank you. C.S. Lewis was an atheist, and then he got converted to Christianity. I think he used to lecture at the University of Oxford. Yes, Oxford. And after he became converted, he began to write very profusely about the Christian faith. I've not watched his, this documentary called uh, Narnia. How many of us have heard about uh, Narnia? Yes. He wrote, about, he wrote the series, the Narnia series, uh, The Lion, and um, uh, there's this story. I've forgotten the name of the lion that is in that story. Please read it. And um, he's one of the foremost, or he was one of the foremost apologists uh, of the Christian faith. But this gentleman I'm talking about globally was respected. I've watched his videos and um, I marvel at his deep knowledge and intellect. Usually, apologetics is targeted at people who, who want to believe in Christ from their intellectual perspective. They want to reason it out. And so, he traveled extensively across the world giving lectures and all that. And last year he died. When it was announced that he was ill and then later he died, the whole Christian world was filled with grief. I think people even prayed before he died that God will heal him. But he died. I didn't watch his funeral, but I was told that his funeral was one that was attended. He was, he was treated with a lot of dignity. Prior to his death, allegations began to emerge that perhaps he was not who he was. There were allegations about his being involved in some sexual misconduct. But according to reports, he denied, and um, you know, the people, a couple of the people that were, that were accusing him were labeled as extortionists, that they were demanding money from him. And so when he died, he was given very sand bearer. But the noise continued, and then investigations, independent investigations were set up. Even his board, the board of the ministry that he ran, set up an invest, independent investigation. And then the conclusion was that many of the allegations were true, that he was involved in grooming women. He had a massage parlor. You know, let me say this. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this whole concept of massage. I, I have been to massage parlor twice, and I said I will never go there again. Those who have been there, you will know. And um, you really have to pray that God will help you when you go to a massage parlor. Fortunately, the two times I've been there, I've, I went there with my wife. So nothing strange would happen. But the man had a massage parlor where there were women there walking, and beyond giving him massage, it was reported that they gave him other things. And um, he would groom them. The word grooming is about preparing people and using the knowledge of the scriptures to tell them that they were a reward for his ministry work. And we see pastors who do that today, people who do that. 
I don't want to dwell on what he did, but it was very sad because this was a very well-respected man. And the legacy that he left suddenly overnight collapsed. I read that the, the church denomination that he belonged to defrocked him posthumously. What does that mean? They removed him from, uh, what's the word, how do I explain this? They removed him from, they removed his ordination derobed. They derobed him posthumously. How sad. And the sad thing was that he kept maintaining that he was not guilty. And people said if he had confessed, if he had written a book and said, just like Jim Baker said, what was the title of Jim Baker's book? Jim Baker did a lot of things. Go read about Jim Baker. Jim Baker went to prison. Same thing. But Jim Baker came out, wrote a book, and said I was wrong. And that in itself hurt people, but this man did not. But the goal here is not to further chastise him. The goal is to say how we as Christians are contributing to this kind of situation. So I put the following thoughts down that I'd like to share with us. There was a video that someone played about the whole episode, and there were quite some lessons that we learned from that video. But first of all, let me read some lessons that I wrote down that we learned from this fall of this man. And the first thing is that, people of God, let's stop setting up our leaders as flawless heroes. You and I are guilty of that. I have constantly said to people, and last night when I was talking with the leadership of the technical department, I said to them something. I said, he who tells you the truth also has the capability and the tendency to exaggerate and introduce a harmless lie to you. And because he's told you the truth, you you grab that lie, you defend that lie. And then from that single lie, there's a crossing of the line, and then he tells more lies. And very soon, you don't know the difference between the lie and the truth anymore. So let's stop lifting up our leaders as if they are flawless, as if they cannot do anything. One writer puts it this way, says that the best of men our best men at their best. The best of men are but men at their best. And because we raise up these people as flawless heroes, you find that even when they make mistakes, and I'll come to that shortly, maybe I should just address it. When we, when we raise people up as flawless heroes, this is how it starts. You know, this person was examining this whole theory, says that many of these leaders, and I've been there because I know, he says there is a connection between standing strong in one area of life and being weak in another. That our willpower is like fuel. You have one tank of willpower and you can use it in different areas. It's like a muscle that you, 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 you use, it strengthens you. The more you use the muscle, it gets strengthened, so to say. But you know, you draw on that willpower in different areas of your life. So for example, if you are drawing, if you've had a stressful life and time for a particular day, and um, you, you have faced very stressful conditions, you find that you may be susceptible to a situation that you would normally be able to resist. If, for example, you have um, been prepared, which is why somebody says that the, when we have victory should be the time that we must be on our guard. Because at those times, your, your stress level is high, you have given a lot, and your willpower is diminished, and then the enemy comes. Look at the story of Elijah. He went into a competition, not a spiritual competition, engagement, 
with the, with the ministers of Baal. And right after he won that engagement, what happened? A woman issued him a threat and he fled into the desert. And he began to ask God to kill him. Thank God for God that asked him, you know what, I guess that you're under stress. You know, people call that, the, there's all kind of name that is given to that, they call it burnout. And we've been in situations where you get burnt out many times. And burnout can be because you're a parent. I'm sure parents have been there when you have been under stress and your child says something that is, that normally you will not snap at. But you just snap at the child, you shout at the child, and the child is wondering what he or she has done. And then later you ask yourself, why did I just do that? So you find leaders who, under stressful conditions, they allow themselves to fall prey to things they would not normally have fallen prey for, which is why we need to be careful. Especially people who travel. I've had to cancel pastors in, my, in this province who say in the name of, of fasting and praying, they are fasting and praying for several months. I'm not talking of general fast like this, but to their own personal fast. They go to the mountain, they leave their wives. Or vice versa, it could be wives who say they are fasting, they leave their husbands for weeks and months. And then either of both become susceptible. So the man or the woman haven't been denied sexual affection by the partner, sees somebody, a woman or a man shaking themselves, what they would normally say no to, suddenly becomes big. We're on 21, uh, 63 days fast, for example. And as we go through this 63 days fast, you find that initially you started strong. I'm sure if you agree that midway, your, your sense of staying power is beginning to diminish. But that's when you go and, and receive new strength. If you decide that you will go on it by yourself, you will find that buff, buff, that is not even healthy, will suddenly begin to smell very attractive. And before you know, you have broken your fast. You know, I went to take an injection, a yellow fever vaccine the other day, and they said to me, very early in the morning, they said to my wife, and ah, you have to eat too, and all that. You know, it was very tempting to use an excuse and say, Lord, you see, they told me to eat. I said to the woman, but why, I'm a medical person, why must I eat? Oh, some people are not able to withstand. They said, said you know what, I'd rather take a drink if I want to, but wait a minute. I told, I had to tell the woman, I said, you know what, I'm fasting and I can't eat. I don't want to eat. I said, is that so? Okay. Um, asked for my age, I told her because she wanted to see if she could exempt me. and said, no, you still have to take it. But we negotiated, and um, I took the injection without eating. And just to be sure that nothing happens, I took a drink. But a drink is better than going to excuse and eat some food that morning. Praise the Lord. I could have used that as an excuse, but I have to be strengthened in my inner man. So that's important. I, so you find that because they have been stressed, the, the ability to resist temptation is gone. And when all the cameras of public glare is gone, they are left with no accountability. And whatever their weakness happens to be suddenly stands up. It doesn't mean that you must always give in to the temptation. But if the temptation is going to happen, that is the time that it will happen. And this is probably when you need to look for some form of accountability or some people to strengthen you so that you will not fall. And those of you who try to stand alone, who try and say, well, I will run this race alone, that's why you will fall. And because you fall, and you alone are falling, you remain in your, in your, in your state of falling. Now, what normally happens with these people is that when they then cross the line, a little line, because they are high up there, they tell themselves, who am I going to confess to? Who am I going to reveal this to? Oh, if I confess to someone or reveal, it's going to affect the ministry. Thousands and millions of people are going to be affected. And so what do they do? They keep it to themselves. 
And you hear people say, well, I've reconciled with God. The question is, did you really reconcile with God? And then you find a constant commission of that. I was telling my wife the other day, and I'm going to make this as, as very uh, cloudy so you can't guess who it is. But there's somebody, there's a man of God in this country who has been under a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, sensational reporting. And one day, uh, and a couple of years ago when I used to fly, and because it was business that I was going for, a number of times I'll fly business class. And this man of God sat close to me. I pretended not to know. I didn't pretend. I refused to acknowledge him, to greet him and say, oh, aren't you so, 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 and so. I'm sure he was trying to make me recognize him, but I just kept. I welcomed him. We chatted. Usually when I want to travel, we sat down on a Sunday night, and I would have been very tired in church. And so when I get into the plane, the next thing is for me to sleep. Throughout that flight, well, let me not exaggerate. Most of the time when I woke up and saw, that man of God was watching a video of very pretty women. Acting and all that. And I said to myself, you know, when I was telling my wife, my wife trusted her. She said if she was the one, she would challenge him. But me, I didn't want to challenge him. And it was a video of pretty women, women acting, women doing this. And I shook my head and said, how will you not be tempted? How will you not be um, pushed to do things, especially when you are alone? I go for conferences many times, and I meet very interesting people. But thank God that you know, there, there are things that God has wired you with that helps you. And so because of my nature, I'm, I'm a pretty reserved person. I'm a pretty, uh, what do you call it? Um, what's the other word? Uh, introverted. So I keep to myself. But if I was an extroverted person, there were opportunities to get to talk to people, and then from talking to people, and you're all alone in your hotel room, and it could lead to one thing. But again, at those times, there are times in those meetings I have extensive telephone calls with my wife. That's why I tell people, when you go outside like that, have a structure of accountability. So I talk for hours on end. How am I going to spend one hour, two hours talking with my wife that evening, and then the following evening I go and commit adultery? It's not likely to happen. When I was studying in the UK, 2005, 2006, you all know, those of you who were here much earlier, you know it. We, we made sure that we touched base. We didn't have a lot of money then, but somehow we touched base with home here. And then my wife came a couple of times. I remember on a lighter note, I used to tell her there was this very beautiful Indian girl that was in the hostel where I was staying. And uh, somehow we got talking to each other. So I'll tell her about the Indian girl. When I was to leave, my wife came down to come and help me pack so that no Indian girl will make me stay back. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We all became friends. She met her, and we all became friends. I mean, I used to counsel her. She would tell me of how some Nigerian guys were putting pressure on her and all that. But you know what? Accountability structure. She was there. She came. And um, her coming had its own pleasant effect. So, we as people, I know my time is going, the first point is let's stop raising up our leaders as flawless heroes. And the best of men are but men at their best. The second point is there is only one flawless example and inspiration, and that is Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. While I understand the need to have and be inspired by, by a physical example that we can relate to, and so you are inspired by a leader that you see, I want to warn, I want to advise that the only person we should look onto is Jesus and to follow others as they follow Jesus. More importantly, as 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 tells us, that as we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we behold the glory of the Lord. We don't behold the glory of a man. We don't behold the righteousness of a man. We don't behold the holiness of a man. We will be changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So our mirror should be the revealed Christ in the scriptures, not any man. 
No matter how holy that man is, no matter how righteous that man is, no matter how powerful that man is, I sound this note of warning because there's a tendency for us to idolize human beings. And you are the problem. You are the problem. I am the problem. We must. And then when the human being falls, people say, well, if that man can fall or that woman can fall, then there is no need. But I must say to you, if your belief in Christ was founded on the righteousness of a human being, then you didn't believe in Christ. You believed in a human being. Praise the Lord. The third point that I'm going to make is that there's an urgent need for all of us to surround ourselves with what I call two things. One or two of those things, accountability structure. Everybody say accountability structure. And then accountability persons. Say accountability persons. Some of us are not accountable to anybody. I've shared with you here, I have, I have someone who worked with me many years ago, not just one, not just two. He pastors a very fast-growing church in, in North America now. His wife, a couple of times, his wife has, has told him not to do certain things. And then, of course, as a man, he, he wants, then the wife will tell him he wants to call me. She'll call, call me. And then she will call me. And when she calls me out, I will tell him, I say, you are very foolish. I don't mince words. You want to, you want to destroy your ministry? When I analyze the issues, the twice that the wife has called me, both times, the wife was correct. And I warn him because he's brought himself under my accountability. And I warn him if I hear that you, you do anything to your wife, you'll be in soup. But let's look at it really. What can I really do to him? <laughs> what can I really do to him? But he's taking me as his accountability figure. So when I say I will deal with him, he knows or he thinks or believes that truly I can deal with him. And perhaps truly I can. And so we talk and I say, go and do this, go and do that. Because he's brought himself under accountability. Who are you accountable to? Who are you accountable to? Sometimes we may not have accountability persons, but we have accountability structures. As a pastor, for example, I have an accountability structure that helps me. I was telling people the other day, the heart of man is desperately wicked, very subtle and wicked. You know, as pastors, we go out to preach sometimes and they give you gifts, they give you honorarium. And you know, there's a tendency when they invite you, the first thing you are thinking about is what is the honorarium that is coming. And so a number of times I go to preach in some places, they give me honorarium, not because I don't need the money, but to deal with my heart and tell my heart, you know what, this is not the reason you are preaching. I take the money, I pray over it, and I sow it back to them. Why do I do that? And I'm not setting up myself as a righteous person. It's not about them. It's about me. It's about telling myself, you are not doing this for the money. Do I need the money? Yes, I need it. But that's an accountability structure for me. There is a time to receive gifts. There's a time not to receive gifts. As a provincial pastor, for example, I say it to my accountant many times, there are benefits that accrue to my office. There are allowances that accrue to my bed. It's not all of them that I take. Why? Because the more you take, the more the tendency to take. And the more the tendency to take, very soon you cross the line and take the one you're not supposed to take. And because you are in charge, they say power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So I bring myself under subjection and I refuse to take what is even my right, even when I need it. Because one day I'm going to leave this office. And when I leave, because I've already built a foundation that I cannot sustain, or may not be able to sustain. And then that's when people go into steal accountability structure. As a pastor, I don't keep the checkbooks. Because we have signatories, I bring myself to subjection to explain to the other signatories what every request is all about. You can ask them. I do not tell them, sign this. What is it for? Just sign it, I told you. No. I explain to them what it is for. 
as the pastor, there are many times people misbehave and they think that I don't know. You don't think that I know the power that is in my office? I know, but I choose not to use that power because many times you use the power to discipline, but that same power to discipline can also become autocratic and you use it to oppress people. So instead of discipline, I'm not saying it's not good to discipline, I would rather just, just leave, leave, leave it. And so sometimes people say we are fools. So we must surround ourselves with accountability structures and accountability persons to help us remain on the straight and narrow path on this journey. There is a tendency for all of us to stray. And as a gentleman puts it, when we cross the line little by little and we justify it, and we again do something and we refuse to repent and we justify it. And then gradually we begin to live a life that is two faced. And then before we know it, we become double sided person. People don't know the life we are living inside of us, they don't know what is happening. And then it's only when the revelations come that things begin to happen. So for me as a pastor, what does all this then reinforce? You know, for many years, I have battled with the cornerstone of my approach to teaching. And to make the teaching I do in church more of expository, a lot of times we, we hear people, but what this has taught me is that we need to expose people more to biblical teaching. You know, there are two forms of teaching, two forms of, 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 of preaching and teaching. There is what is called topical teaching, where I take a topic, a topic like uh, depression, and then I sprinkle it with scriptures to make it valid, and then many times we are teaching the philosophies of men. Or we, it may be correct, and then we, we, good, it's good, and I have nothing against topical preaching, it's powerful. But I've come to realize that expository teaching expository teaching is taking the scriptures there have been a couple of times i've done expository teaching here and the feedback i hear sometimes and you know when things happen sometimes leaders we are to blame we need to let people know what they're supposed to people oh is this a bible college is teaching to you are going to hear more of that going forward i thought somebody would say amen you are going to hear more of that. So you see, we take, we take let's say, Jude, the book of Jude, and we read, we, we do an expository teaching on the book of Jude, we draw the lessons from there. When you finish teaching, people will remember the book of Jude. But most times we like to be fed little pieces here and there, and there's no coherence. And so what we are doing is that we are depending more on the videos and the CDs of what men teach and we have no alignment with what they are teaching and what the scriptures are saying. That is why a man can tell a woman, a pastor can tell a woman that, you know, God has given me a higher grace and uh, because I'm on a higher grace, you can sleep with me, my grace will cover your grace. What utter nonsense. What stupidity. What, what, what thing that comes from the pit of hell. Or that is why pastors can tell. You know, I tell people, if I would, God forbid that I would do that. But I was telling a group of people that I said, I know what to preach. But we are not of them that pervert the word of God. I know what to preach that will cause you to be excited and, and your, your, your sensations are tingling. But when you leave, nothing has come into you. But we encourage such. We go to some places, you don't know what they have used, and then you preach it. Please, let us bring our focus back to God, back to the Word of God, back to Christ. And so we become like the Berean Christians. When you are taught, you go back to your Bible, you look at what it says in the Bible, and whether what the person is teaching. You should come to a place where somebody is teaching, and the person says something, your spirit should say, no, 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 that doesn't sound right. And you go back and research it. No matter who the man of God is, no matter how so-called anointed he is, no matter his qualifications, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is inside of us. 
that we do not need any man to teach us because he, the anointing, teaches us, reminds us of everything. But he can only remind you of what you have deposited inside of you. Praise the Lord. As I close, let me state that the Holy Spirit will always lead us. But how well do we respond to him? You know, we will continue to have this kind of issues about men of God derailing. But you know what it says? It just tells us that they are still men. And one of the things that we need to understand is that sin is never satisfied with the status quo. When you hide anything, you know, you know it's only light that can expose darkness. When you hide anything, in that darkness, it begins to, 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 to breed. Sin is not satisfied with the status quo. I heard that statement a few, um, you know, not long ago. Sin does not stay with its place. So somebody, somebody commits adultery, for example, and you hide it. You say it's only once. When you hide it and you don't confess it, Sin is never satisfied with that. Then there is another commission of adultery. Then another, then another. And then from adultery to abortion, murder. From adultery to all kinds of other sins. Sin is never satisfied with status quo. So what do we do? When we sin, the Bible tells us what to do. We confess to God. We repent. And we forsake. Everybody say confess. Repent. And forsake. If need be, depending on who is involved, depending on who is impacted, you will have to tell others. When you tell others, you have put yourself under accountability. And then you move yourself. You cannot say that you will not do something again when you surround yourself with what will make you do that thing. So remove yourself from the environment, from the things that will help you. Brothers and sisters, this journey is a journey that is very, very tough. When I mean tough, is it demands a lot. But the Spirit of God is there to help us. I, I have been young, as they say, now I'm old. One thing I've learned is that the Spirit of God has never forsaken us, will not forsake us in telling us what to do. The question is, are we listening? Are we listening? So, brothers and sisters, let's stop lifting up any man as, um, as God. No man is God. Only God is God. So I guess I can take off this mask so that um, you can see that it is Pastor Sunday and not uh, anybody else. Even this one too, you never know what is hiding behind this phone. But as we close, let's rise to our feet. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. And cry unto God this morning and say, Father, help me. Help me. Help me, Lord. Go ahead. Cry to God this morning. Tell him, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to be accountable. Help me, Lord. Leseke pro makante le brama zondolo brama ndele ba Ze pro makande le brama sandolo brama ndele brama sendele brama pa sendele brama Ze pro bama mama sandele brama ndele brama ndele brama ndele brama sandele brama Ze pro mandele brama sandele brama ndele brama sandele brama ndele brama Ze pro ma sandolo brama ndele brama ndele brama ndele brama sandolo brama ndele brama Ze pro mandele brama sandele brama ndele brama Reboroba sandele pramandaraba purify my heart let me be as good precious silver purify my
sing that song as a prayer this morning. persuaded in my spirit that there are some of you that need to do a deep confession to the Lord you are living a double life I'm not going to ask you to come out but this may be the chance that God is giving you to do repentance before him what we see is not who you are you are living a double life there are husbands that are living double lives. There are wives here that are living double lives. You are not who you are at home. This is the time for you to repent. Otherwise, your sin will catch up with you. The Bible says that judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. I am speaking this morning that as many as will refuse to repent, the Lord will expose them. And the exposure will be so great that some of them may lose their lives. You have the opportunity to repent before God. I'm not asking you to come out. Go to God this morning. You can stand, you can kneel and say, Lord, I am coming out of my hiding. I am coming out of my double life. And Lord, I am saying to you that I will live only one life. Henceforth, talk to the Lord this morning. We're gonna take a little time at this because I'm not gonna rush. I will not be accused of not giving you time. As I'm talking to you about this, I'm examining my own life. Any area of double-mindedness, double-facedness, I'm examining myself. Go ahead and talk to the Lord. But I know that there are people here. You know it. You are not who you are. Talk to the Lord this morning. The refiner's fire is here this morning.